another day. We thank you for another hour, another week, another month, another year, God. We thank you for, from the bottom of our hearts, God, we give you reverence and honor tonight. And we praise your name, God, just for allowing us to see Wednesday. Now, God, here it is once again. Uh, another Bible study setting, God, in which you have allowed us to reach from our home to out to the members of the historic 9th Street Missionary Baptist Church homes. And then, God, to all of our friends and relatives, God, we even get to touch them tonight. God, we want to share. We want to share with your people tonight a word from, from you. And I ask tonight, God, is that you would just make this word plain, Make it live, God. Make it alive, God. And then make it dwell on the inside of the hearts of your people. God, I promise tonight to do the very best that I can with what I've been given. God, I pray over this script tonight. I pray over your word, God. And God, I just pray tonight that somebody receives the word of God. From my heart to theirs, God, they just receive the word of God. And whatever wisdom, whatever knowledge you have placed on the inside of me, God, I pray that it reaches somebody, it reaches some man, it reaches some woman, some child tonight. And God, I promise tonight, I promise to do the very best that I can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is good to see all of you out and online tonight. It's good to see all of you. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into it tonight. We're going to turn this music down just a little bit. Listen, don't forget to show up on Sunday ready to praise the Lord. Amen. Show up on Sunday just ready to praise the Lord. Amen. But before we get to Sunday... Let's have a little church on tonight. Amen. The title of tonight's message, the title of tonight's message is entitled, Amen. It is entitled, A Godly Family in an Ungodly World. But the subtitle is No Place Like Home. Everybody type that in tonight. No place like home. No place, no place, no place like home. And I don't know if you are all from Fort Smith or not, but oftentimes we go on trips to far off places. We go on vacations and some of us are raring to get back home. We are just wanting to get back to our bed, our house, our couch, our refrigerator. Amen. We are just raring to get back home. There is no place like home. We are excited to get back to our family when we haven't saw them in a long time. Demetria, if you're online tonight, you ought to be shouting because you're all the way out in Baltimore, and you, when you come home, girl, I know you are just shouting, waiting, can't wait to wait to see your mama and your daddy, your sisters, your brother. So there is no place like home. Amen. Amen. Somebody ought to help me out tonight. Amen. No place like like home. Um, here's our scripture for tonight. Luke, Luke 15 and 20. It says. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. I'm going to read this again tonight because this is talking about the prodigal son tonight. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father 
saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Tonight we are talking about no place like home. Go ahead and type that in tonight. No place like home. Most homes do not have God anywhere in the picture. This is our note of disclaimer tonight. Most homes don't have God anywhere in the picture. And most people do not respect God's word enough to live like he wants. And as we discuss the home, as, as, as God would have it, we must face the reality that most homes are not of this nature. And even many of us did not grow up in such a home. Let's be honest tonight. The few that did know that there is no place like home. Amen. So, let's accept the Lord. It says in Psalms 127 and 1, Accept the Lord. Build the house. They labor in vain that build it. I'm going to say this again. Accept the Lord. Build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Have you ever wondered what a house built by God would look like? I'm asking a question tonight. Have you ever wondered what a house built by God would look like? What qualities or traits would be present in a household or family unit that is built upon God's word and filled with his spirit? These are great questions to consider if you are striving to have a godly family in an ungodly world. I'm going to say this again tonight for all of those who are online. These are great questions to consider if you are striving to have a godly family in an ungodly world. Now, I need to show this to you tonight. All who are online, I took this off of the internet tonight, and I need to share this with you. First of all, this is how the house on my left, this is an ungodly house. This house on my left, maybe on your right, but this is an ungodly an ungodly house an ungodly house can i talk to you tonight and just keep it 100 and keep it real with you tonight an ungodly house has a whole lot of cracks in it an ungodly house is unstable an ungodly house is always sinking an ungodly house frame is not always structured correctly an ungodly house has a whole lot of cracks in the walls and in the windows an ungodly house never stands but i need to share with everybody that's online tonight this is what a godly house looks like a godly house is able to withstand a storm and i ought to have some witnesses online tonight to say that yes pastor that's very true that a a godly house is what is able to withstand any storm any rain that it may go through any friction on the inside a godly house is able to go through but an ungodly house can't stand a storm I'm just preaching and talking about what I'm talking about tonight. And there are a lot of our houses who look like this right here on the left tonight. Why is it that our houses cannot withstand a storm? Why is it that our houses cannot stand friction? Why is it that our houses always have these crooks and, and always leaning to the right and to the left? It's because we have an ungodly house. We have some things that are unequally yoked on the inside of our house. Matter of fact, we got some people 
people staying in our house that really don't belong, that really shouldn't be staying there. We got some things on the inside of our houses that we really shouldn't be drinking of, but they're on there. We got some things on the inside of our houses that we're smoking and choking on, and it shouldn't be on the inside of a godly, a godly house. I'm just talking tonight. So, a godly, an ungodly house, it sinks. An ungodly house sinks. An ungodly house sinks. An ungodly house is unstable. But watch this. A godly house. There's something about a God in the house. From the outside, you can tell how pretty and clean it is. You can tell how the sun is always shining over a God in the house. There's just something about a godly, a godly house. Let's let's dig a little bit. If your desire is to have a home that is built by the Lord, I believe a great example to look at and learn from is the home presented in Luke 11, 15 through 32. And most of us know this parable as the story of the prodigal son. However, if we look a little closer, we can discover some key characteristics that will be present when the Lord builds your house. Hold on. Tell somebody, don't leave the room yet because we ain't done. Tell them to hold on. The first characteristic or the first thing we want to point out in this story, this, this parable, is liberty. Although the father didn't have to, he accepted his son's request. Everybody writing that word liberty tonight. Although the father didn't have to, he accepted his son's request. In a family, it is normal and expected by parents that their children will fall into line with the demands and expectations of the parents. Hold on. However, as the children get older and become more independent, the parents must accept that as adults, we are free to make choices that determine the course of our lives. Hear me tonight. They're free to make choices that determine the course of their lives. And I know as, as a parent, we're not going to always be happy with the choices that our children make. Can I be honest with you tonight, mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle? Listen, your mom and daddy were always happy with the choices that you made. Even though they taught you right from wrong, even though they taught you Ephesians 6 and 12, children, obey, or 6 and 1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right under thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. They gave you all of that wisdom, all of that knowledge, but somehow or another, they still end up making some bad choices. And, and if truth be told, some of us are still making some bad choices. Hold on. Even though we may make choices he does not agree with, God still gives us the freedom to choose. In a home built by the Lord, there is a certain level of liberty and acceptance that is given that allows each member the freedom to choose even if it is a choice to leave and live 
how they choose. We should also expect that those with wisdom will offer advice about those choices. In reality, that advice is usually ignored. Oh, it's usually ignored. You've done all this training, you've done all this teaching, you've told them right from wrong, you've told them what they should and shouldn't do, but yet and still, some of those things that you tell them goes in one ear and out the other because in reality, they have ignored uh, some of the things that you have said. Not saying that it was not important, not saying that they just really wanted to be disobedient, but the fact of the matter is, they still had to make a choice to go and do some of the things that they have done that was not right in your eyesight and in the eyesight of God. So hold on, let me help somebody tonight. Everybody has the freedom to choose. We all have the freedom to choose. You have the freedom to choose who you're going to marry. You have the, free, the freedom to choose who you're going to date. You have the freedom to choose if you want to accept this job or not. You have the freedom to accept, uh, choose what church you want to go to, what denomination you want to be a part of. You have the freedom to literally choose. But let me share this with you tonight. Life is full of choices. Choose carefully. And that's my saying to somebody on tonight. That's my word to somebody on tonight that's online. Choose carefully. Amen. Choose carefully. Amen. Choose carefully. But hold on. No place. No place like home. So we talked about the liberty, meaning the freedom, but now let's look at provision. Can we look at provision? Everybody type in provision tonight. Luke 15, 16 through 17. Are the members of your household getting what they need in your home? Are the members of your house, of your household, getting what they need in your home? Hear me tonight. And I am not referring to the physical things like food and clothing. That ain't what I'm talking about. Are your spouse and children being provided with the emotional and spiritual support they need to assure them that they are loved and appreciated and that they matter. Let me help me included tonight. Are your spouse and children being provided with the emotional and spiritual support they need to assure them that they are loved and appreciated that they matter? Amen. I try my best, I promise, I try my best daily to tell my family how much I love them every day. Chloe, before she goes off to school, I tell her I love her. Stephanie, I tell her I love her. Every day, I try to make it my business. You know I love you. Amen. I try my best. And this is something that our households are literally missing. We are missing that word L-O-V-E. We don't tell each other enough how much we love them. We wait till they are stressed out in a, in a casket, in a coffin. We wait till they are six feet uh, deep to tell them how much we love them. Then we want to pour flowers all over the scenery. We want to do this big grandstand to show them. I need to tell somebody tonight is the night in which you need to begin now in telling if you haven't been doing it, start telling your people in the inside of your home how much you love them and watch what it does. Watch the difference that it begins to make. Hold on. 
when we provide for the physical and mental and spiritual needs of our home, we are exemplifying the spirit of God. God is love. Amen. What he has done and continuously do to do for us is love us. Y'all better hear me tonight. The prodigal son. The prodigal son. He remembered that everything he needed could be found in his father's house. I need to tell you that again tonight. The prodigal son remembered that everything that he needed was in his father's house. I ain't talking about the clothes. I ain't talking about the jewelry. And we know that this father quickly told one of his servants to bring out and put upon his son who stood in rags and the best. He told him to get the best robe and ring and sandals. He knew that everything that he needed was in his father's house. I need to ask somebody on tonight, does your family member know that everything that they need can be found in your house? Matter of fact, can we go and make it and take it down to 9th Street tonight? Do, do you know that everything that you need, that you desire can be found right at 9th Street, 1023 North 9th Street in Fort Smith, Arkansas? All you got to do, baby, is walk through the doors. And I tell you, once you walk through the doors, there's an ambiance of people that are going to be waiting on you to supply you and give you the things that you need. So, 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 so here it is tonight. The prodigal son says, I left home, but I knew what was at the house. I knew what was on the, on the inside of the house still waiting for me. I know what my daddy had in the house. And I need to ask somebody tonight, do you know what's in the house? Somebody don't know what's in the house. It's apparent that somebody doesn't know what's in the house. Hold on. Can the members of your household say this about your home? Hold on. Here's the third one. Compassion. Write this down. Compassion. Write down compassion. Luke 15 and 20. God is full of compassion. But what about your household? Is your household full of compassion tonight? Is your home a place where the members of your family can find mercy, help, or comfort during their time of affliction and trouble? Or do they encounter judgment and blame? Let's keep it real tonight. Let's keep it 100 tonight. I'm going to move closer to the camera so that I can see your eyes. Amen. What can they find in your house? Can they find mercy in a time of trouble? Can they find comfort? Or do they find, when, when they're in trouble, do they find judgment and blame? See, we got it bad. We like to blame folks. We like to judge folks. Even our own family members, we like to blame them and judge me and judge them. I told you they were no good. I told you. I, it's always that I told you. It's always I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. the blame game. We we love that that was your fault. What do they find? In their time of mercy, their, their time of, of need, of mercy, of help, what, what do they get? What do they get tonight? Somebody needs to answer that. Hey Amen. One of the ways that God demonstrates his compassion is that he never gives us what we deserve but he always gives us what we need somebody ought to be shouting tonight we don't always get what we deserve but we get what we need and if we got what we deserve 
somebody ought to be shouting that I'm glad the Lord don't always give me what I deserve. Make sure you and the members of your household know how to show compassion to each other rather than condemnation. I'm still learning this. Uh, you, you, you dealing with a preacher, a pastor that's still learning this. I'm not the best at it. I'm still learning. I'm trying my best. Hold on. Treat others as you would have them to treat you. Treat others the way that you would have them to treat you. Let me give you this tonight. God doesn't always give us what we want, but he always gives us what we need. Let's move a little bit swifter tonight. We begin looking at the, at the parable of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ gave in Luke 15, 11 to 32 as a source to identify the characteristics of a home that embodies the spirit of God. A house built by the Lord. We discover that based upon interference of this text, a home built upon God's word and filled with his spirit will offer liberty, provision, compassion for those who are part of it. Are those traits present within your home? Now, do the members of your household have the freedom to choose the path of their lives as adults? And even if you do not understand or agree with it, hold up, it's fixing to get real good. Are the spiritual and physical and mental and emotional needs of you and your family, your household, being provided for ever by everyone in the house. When mistakes are made by someone in your household, or someone finds themselves in affliction or trouble, do they find a merciful and compassionate heart within the household or condemnation? In addition to those traits, we also find the following traits in the home presented in the parable of the prodigal son. Hear me tonight. Watch this. Restoration. Write it down tonight. Restoration. This is in 21 through 24. Restoration. We are almost done. When the son acknowledged his disobedience, the father wanted to acknowledge to that son and others that the son was forgiven and his relationship with the father had been restored. I need to share this with you tonight. Regardless of what you have done, regardless of your past history, the father is still ready to receive you and to restore you. Meaning what, Reverend Carter? To give you back what it is that you need. He was there to receive his boy and, and literally forgive him. And their relationship was restored. Hold on. In many families, when someone makes a mistake, acknowledges it and acknowledges it, tries to make a change for the better, members of the family oftentimes ostracize the person and constantly hold that mistake over their head. Why is it that we do this? Why do we continuously to hold things over our family members' heads? Matter of fact, over anybody's head. Why do we hold these grudges over folks' heads? 
some of us have a bad habit of holding of past years problems, past years sit situations, past years arguments. We have a bad a bad habit of just holding the things over people's head. What if God held everything that you did in your life over your head? I need to ask somebody tonight. What if God treated you that way? Oh yeah. I remember you saying in 1960, I'm going to hold that over your head. Let's do it 2021. Oh, yeah, I remember you saying in 74, uh, I'm going to hold that over your head. Yeah, I remember you cut somebody out. Yeah, I'm going to hold that over your head. Yeah, I remember you uh, went down the street and you stole that candy out the penny candy store. Yeah, I'm going to hold that. Oh, what if God held every single thing that you've done over your head? What would your long life? your long list look like I need to tell somebody tonight stop holding stuff over people's head some of us got a bad habit with holding things and grudges over people's head amen the Bible says that all have sin not y'all have sin. that means the preacher the deacon the usher the mother boy they say everybody that sinned. So, so why is it that we hold stuff over people's heads? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me let me say this tonight. The truest evidence of forgiveness is when you don't allow the wrong of the past to cause you to mistreat the person in the present. When someone makes a mistake in your household and has the courage to admit it and seek your forgiveness, reassure them that they are still loved and are a part of the family that goes that it, it goes for the church that's the church regardless of who make a mistake regardless of who's done what we're still supposed to love them we still so supposed to still reassure them that they are a part of the family that they are still a part of the body of christ but we as christians have a bad habit of just emptying out emptying out all the bad seeds that were that, that 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 committed these outrageous these outrageous things on the inside of the church and we have a tendency I'm talking to me tonight we have a tendency of getting rid of, of getting rid of folks and it is not our it is not left up to us to get rid of into hold on hold on Hold on. Unconditional love. The elder son felt that the younger son should have been treated differently by the father because of the younger son's actions. However, the father had to reassure the elder son that his love for both of them was not based on their actions but their relationship to the father. Y'all better hear this tonight. A household filled with the word and spirit of God demonstrates concern, care, and compassion for one another, not based on what a person does or doesn't do, but because that is who God is and what he commands. <laughs> we get close to the end. The parable of the Good Samaritan exemplifies this. The poor victim was looked down upon from those who knew better. Yet, I'm going to say this again. The parable of the Good Samaritan exemplifies this the poor victim 
who was looked down upon from those who knew better and a complete stranger showed compassion. You can look that up over in Luke 10, 25 through 37. First John uh, 4, 7 through 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. I hope the right people are hearing me tonight. Where love is in the home, here you go. Where love is in the home, there is joy in the heart. Where there is love in the home, there is joy in the heart. And we're walking around and we see a lot of people who has no joy in their heart. That's because there is no love in the home. I just want to help you. A house built by the Lord will exemplify the traits of God and his love. You will know God's spirit dwells there and it will place it will be a place where people always want to want to come back to. If you desire that these traits be present in your home, the Lord must be first present in your life. And I'm hurrying. Certainly, we are not talking about every home and family. We must face reality, even if it is not preferred. But if we try to build godly homes, the home will be a place of refuge, a place of security, a place of love. Each member of the household should be a part of each other of each other's purpose in purpose and spirit. First John, I mean John 15, 1 through 7 says, Jesus explains that, that branches cannot exist without being a part of the vine. Here's the conclusion tonight. And we out of here. Here's the conclusion. Here's the conclusion tonight. We must remember that we cannot have a godly home without the guidance of good through his word. Submit yourselves or submit yourself to God and God's word daily and ask him to begin to build your household in a family that exemplifies and glorifies his word and his spirit. A home can be a place of fun memories or bitter resentment. We know what God wants in a home and it is up to us to make it happen in our very own homes. God bless you tonight. And my personal prayer tonight is that literally you took something away from what we share or shared with all of you. It is God who has given us our homes. It is God who has placed the things that we need on the inside of the home to take care of those individuals who are literally on the inside with us. And I ask tonight, I ask tonight that you remember who gave you the things that you have. It was not you, but it was, it was God. Let us tonight, if you have any special prayer requests, let us go before the Lord tonight and let's just pray. Let's just pray tonight for all of our families. Amen. Eternal God, our Father, how we thank you. God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. Most importantly, God, we thank you for just showing up in a major way. And tonight, God, we thank you for a rock-solid foundation. We thank you that our homes, God, are 
what you have given us. They are good and very good. And the things that you have placed on the inside of those homes were just for all of us. God, tonight we are praying for our families that we learn how to forgive even when we are wrong, God, even when uh, people have friends and families have came against one another, God. We ask that you teach us how to forgive, God. God, I'm asking tonight is that we be made better, God, because of what we have heard tonight. And let us trust you more, even in our even in our coming and in our going, even in our relationships with family and friends. Allow us to trust you, God, and be that forgiving person, God, show, showing that we are that we can show compassion, that we can, God, that we can be forgiving people. And God, tonight there are so many out there, God, so many families who have uh, been broken, God, because of little small situations, problems, God, because of uh, angerness, anger and bitterness, God, have stepped in between them. And God, I am a living witness that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and no man is better than the other. God, I promise tonight, God, is that we literally want to do our very best, God, and being more Christ-like in every situation. God, regardless of how we're treated, regardless of how we're talked about, we just want to be better. And tonight, God, I ask for the individuals that don't have strength, uh, the strength of forgiveness, the energy to forgive, God, that you would give them energy, give them strength, give them the words to say, to forgive their fellow brother and sister in Christ. God, we are wanting to just be a great people, God, in a great nation, God. We are wanting to just be a great representation of who you are. God, we thank you now for family. We thank you for friends. God, we thank you for the, the air that we breathe. God, we are just grateful and in debt to you on tonight, God. And we ask that you would just continuously to hold us in the hollow of your hand, but also in the hollow of your care. God, I ask tonight, God, is that you would simply wake all of us up in the morning, giving us a new day to make it right with you, but also making it right with the individuals that we come in contact with and that we don't have a great relationship with. Let us be the bigger people on tomorrow, God. Let us be better people. Let them see that. We, that let them see the Christ in us. God, let them, let them see you being revealed through us on tomorrow. God, now for our families and our friends, I pray and I ask that you would simply cover all of us as we lay down on tonight. Give us a soft pillow, God, but wake us up right early in the morning, starting us on, on our way and giving us a new day. And then, God, allowing us to go through tomorrow's day, knowing that we have the strength and the power and the wisdom to do as you have taught us through your word. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to tell you, God bless you, and Sunday is sure to come. Listen, if you are in need of a church home, and you are not worshiping with anyone, you're not attending any worship services, listen, I encourage you to get on our live, if it be, uh, if that's your choice, if you want to come to the sanctuary, get to the sanctuary, amen, amen, the Lord he wants more foot soldiers. And tonight, you can be a foot soldier. Amen. You can be another one of his, 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 his children, his, his soldiers that are, that are out there in the vineyard. Amen. You can be that person tonight. Amen. You can gain a new birthday tonight. You can come by letter of faith of candidate for baptism or on Christian experience. We just ask that you would come. But come while the blood runs warm in your vein. That means while the blood is still active in your vein. Amen. For the night cometh, and no man, we don't know the day or the hour when the Lord, the Lord shall appear again. We don't know. But death is one day going to come knocking at all of our doors. And it's our job to be ready. Amen. God bless you tonight. God bless you for who you are and what the Lord has instilled in you. Until next week, we'll see you again right here at the same place, 
same station. We only got three more, two more opportunities for a Bible study for this year, and it will be over with at the end of this month. Amen. Get to the sanctuary on Sunday. There's going to be a word there just for, just for you. me going those days when I feel like giving up Thank <laughs> you. 